So thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to speak. Um, and it's going to be a little bit of a strange colloquium, but I think hopefully there will be something interesting in it. I'm going to talk about topology at high temperature from the lattice. This is going to be a talk about quantum chromodynamics and its behavior at very high temperatures, such as existed very early in the universe. And I'm going to try to connect that to physics, which, uh, for instance, may explain the dark matter of the universe. And this is work that I've been doing with uh, collaborators, mostly in Darmstadt, uh, Thomas Jan, Perry, uh, Perry Yonaka, uh, sorry, Jonaka, and Daniel Robaina, but also in collaboration with other members of the um, Collaborative Research Center, Strong Interaction Matter Under Extreme Conditions, which combines can, together theorists in uh, Frankfurt, in Bielefeld, and in Darmstadt. So let me outline what I want to talk about. I'm going to discuss a puzzle, one of the largest puzzles in science, I would argue, which is the dark matter in the universe. And then a second puzzle, maybe not as well known, but also very interesting, which is the fact that the strong interactions, quantum chromodynamics, appear to respect a symmetry, which is time reversal symmetry. And in fact, because of issues involving uh, topology in QCD, very non-trivial issues, which I'll at least outline, it's a surprise that quantum chromodynamic respects that symmetry. And uh, there's a proposal which could explain why this symmetry is respected by the strong interactions, which turned out to give a candidate for the dark matter, which ties everything together. But in order to investigate that, we're going to have to understand better this issue of topology in the strong interactions. I'll describe a little better what the strong interactions are, in what sense they have topology, and how we go about trying to understand that topology using uh, tools of lattice QCD. I'll try not to make that part too technical, but I think that there are a couple of interesting ideas there involving sampling and sampling weights and uh, what one can do with those. So <clears throat> let me first start by saying that one of the largest mysteries in modern science is the dark matter, that the kinds of material that we know about, which make up the atoms, represent only about 4.6% of the energy budget in the universe. Most of the energy budget is something called dark energy. And as far as we understand, that is just that empty space has a very slight non-zero energy density. And there's nothing that prevents that in any of our fundamental theories. And as far as we can understand, that's just the way it is. And it's a puzzle, but it's not as big a puzzle as the dark matter making up about 24% of the universe's energy budget, because this is real genuine stuff, which gravitationally clumps. That's why we call it matter. And it interacts very weakly or not at all with the ordinary matter we're made out of. It has negligible electric charge, and so far, we have only been able to detect its presence through its gravitational effects. That's why we call it dark. And it's cold in the sense that it's basically sitting still and not all flying around. It had a negligible pressure already when the universe was 3,000 times smaller than it is now, still does. And basically, all we know about it are these three properties, that it's matter, that it's dark, and that it's cold. So its name actually tells you Cold dark matter actually tells you everything we know about this stuff. There's another mystery, which at first sight has nothing to do with the first one I mentioned. And that is the time reversal symmetry of the strong interactions QCD. So what is time reversal symmetry? It's a statement that if you film some physics going on and then you run the movie backwards, then at least at the level of the microphysics, everything you see makes sense. It follows the usual physical laws. We know that statistical mechanics breaks time reversal. 
entropy increases. When you run the movie backwards, entropy decreases. This is why it looks so funny to run a movie backwards. You see flames unburning things or broken objects flying together. Um, but at the microscopic level, the individual motions of the, of the particles in those events actually are obeying the standard laws of physics and they make sense. We know that this time reversal is not an exact symmetry of nature. We've observed this violation in the weak interactions, but only through extremely small and subtle effects. They've been observed in a handful of experiments all involving so-called neutral meson oscillation. In many places you could go and look for it where you would sort of expect it if it is not a symmetry of nature, it's not been seen. So let me explain that a little bit more in the electromagnetic interactions, which we're more familiar with. So imagine a simple experiment in electromagnetism. I charge up two plates of capacitor, one of them positive, one of them negative. We can calculate then that an electric field is pointing from the positive up to the negative one. And I throw a positive electric charge in. At first, it's moving horizontally, but it will deflect under these fields towards the negative charge plate. So it'll follow this green path. If I watch the movie backwards, which I'm showing by putting up this little screen here, and what's on the other side of the screen is what happens when the movie runs backwards. The positive charges, the negative charges, they're just sitting there, they're in the same place. The electric field, you can calculate from that, it's just the same. Instead of ending on this side, the charge starts on this side, flying somewhat downwards. And the effect of this electric field is to absorb that downward motion and have it come out in a straight line. That is, it follows precisely the reverse of the path that it follows in the uh, forward version of the movie. So the same laws of electromagnetism that determine this path would determine the reverse path if you run the movie backwards. So it's completely consistent with time reversal. What about magnetic fields? They're a little bit more confusing uh, because they're a pseudo vector. That means rather than thinking about the magnetic field itself, you have to think about where it came from. If I say that there's a magnetic field sticking out of the board, indicated by these little arrowheads here, then what I'm really saying is that there's a current flowing in a loop. And that magnetic field is a consequence of that current, which we can determine using the right hand rule. Under the influence of that magnetic field, a charged carrier will deflect according to um, V cross B, and we find that that will give a downward deflection to this trajectory, yielding the trajectory shown. When I reverse the order of time, then the current running around in the loop runs in the opposite direction. Therefore, if I use the laws of physics to calculate what the magnetic field should be, again, applying the right-hand rule, I find that it's going into the board. That means that a particle coming in here from the right and moving towards the left will again be deflected downwards and will indeed follow the time reversal of this path. So even though the magnetic field itself has to flip sign, it's a pseudo vector when you reverse the flow of time, the physical consequences are all the same. The paths that particles follow when you reverse the flow of time will then be the paths that they would, that they would follow in that scenario. So the laws of electromagnetism respect time reversal invariance. How would I check to see if time reversal invariance is a real actual symmetry of nature. Well, let's think of a simple example. Um, let's take a neutron. So what I really want to test is not only what's happening in electromagnetism, but also what's happening under the strong interactions. A neutron is some very complicated state. It's a bunch of charged particles called quarks held together by the strong interactions in some way that we don't have to describe, and that's a good thing because we don't exactly know how it works. Um, but what we know is that although the neutron is neutral, it's built out of individual charged particles. It also has a net spin. And as it's spinning, 
the charged particles are somehow moving around inside of that neutron. If I place the neutron in a magnetic field, then I can guarantee that the spin, if I cool the neutron, I can guarantee that the spin will line up in a certain direction. So here the spin will be pointing up along the magnetic field. And I can then ask the question, could it be that the complex dynamics holding together this neutron cause some of the plus charges in there to float up to the top and some of the minus charges to float down to the bottom? We don't know any fundamental reason that couldn't happen. But if it does happen, it's a violation of time reversal symmetry. Let's see why that's true. Let's consider this experiment running the movie backwards. When I run the movie backwards, the current going around clockwise, uh, anti-clockwise here, sorry, will now go along clockwise. That means the magnetic field will point in the opposite direction. That means that the spin will spin in the opposite direction. Alternatively, you can say when you see something spinning, if you run the move back, movie backwards, it's spinning in the opposite direction. The laws of physics, which would make plus charges float up to the top of this neutron, would make a neutron spinning in the opposite direction have the plus charges float down to the bottom. But watching the movie backwards, you would see the, float, the plus charges float up to the top. So a law, of, a law of physics, which makes the pluses float to the top, <clears throat> will give you a movie reverse that does not follow the same laws of physics. Therefore, if time reversal is a good symmetry of nature, it must be that it doesn't happen that positive charges flow to the top and minus charges flow to the bottom of a neutron. Um, and so this is a sensitive place to look to see if time symmetry is truly a symmetry or is violated. And people have measured this in neutrons um, to extraordinary precision and have demonstrated that in fact, there is not such a displacement of charge into a neutron, or if there is, it's smaller than one part in 10 to the minus 26 e centimeters. And this is roughly speaking 13 orders of magnitude smaller than what you would get if you just separated two charges by the radius of the neutron. So this is a very, very strong um, null measurement of this effect, implying that time reversal symmetry, if it's violated, it's violated in the neutron by a very, very small amount. Since the neutron is held together by the strong interactions, that means that the strong interactions respect time reversal invariance. Now to see why that's puzzling, let me remind you what the strong interactions are. Okay, and here, um, the details are too much to really properly explain in a colloquium. So I'm going to give you a hand wavy picture of what the strong interactions are. And either you already know this or you don't. And if you don't, then just carry away this hand wavy picture. Don't try to understand it in great detail. There are six kinds of quarks. And each one comes in three distinct types, which we name flavors because they're, uh, sorry, which we name colors because there's three. And so we sophomorically name these three types, uh, red, green, and blue. You should think of this redness, greenness, and blueness as three kinds of charge, sort of like electrical charge. Except because there's multiple kinds of them, there's multiple ways that an electromagnetic field could couple to those charges. And in fact, there are eight ways that an uh, electromagnetic-like field could couple to these charges these quarks carry. Each one has an associated photon-like particle, which we'll name a gluon, so as not to confuse it with a photon. The word gluon is because their interactions are very strong and they glue together all of these quarks into lumps. Um, the, the trick is that because there are multiple colors and there are multiple photon-like gluons, it turns out that each gluon is colored as seen by other gluons. So the gluons, the uh, photon-like degrees of freedom interact with each other in a non-trivial way. And that's what makes the theory um, interesting and also what makes the theory hard to solve. The quarks evolve in this background of 
colored gluonic fields according to a covariant derivative, which is very similar to the way that charged particles evolve in uh, an electromagnetic field. And as always in physics, all physics can be derived from a Lagrangian, here actually a Lagrangian density, which you integrate over space to get a Lagrangian. This involves the quarks and it also involves the gluons. And because physics is Lorentz invariant, this Lagrangian has to be a Lorentz scalar. And if you think about electric and magnetic fields, you'll remember that there are only two ways to combine them to form a scalar. One written here in the uh, covariant notation is essentially electric field squared minus magnetic field squared. And the other written here is electric dot magnetic. And that's actually a pseudo scalar, which you see in index notation because it has the epsilon tensor and the epsilon tensor is um, flip sign when you perform either a parity transformation or you reverse the direction of time. So there are eight parameters describing this theory. The masses of the six quarks, the gauge coupling, which turns into determining a fundamental scale where QCD phenomena happen, which is roughly the proton mass, and this angle theta. And because theta multiplies E dot B, and because E is a vector and B is a pseudo vector, then the, this last term here is actually a time reversal violating term. And if theta is not zero, then both time reversal and parity are violated. Okay, so let's look a little bit more at this theta. As I just said, I can rewrite this in a non-covariant notation as the electric field dot the magnetic field summed over these eight versions of electromagnetism that stick together to form the theory of uh, the strong interactions. And this combination E dot B, it turns out can be rewritten as the ordinary derivative of a four vector K that is, it's a um, total derivative and as you know, when I integrate a total derivative, so the Grangian has to be integrated over all of space and time to find the action. And when I integrate a total derivative over all of space and time, uh, it vanishes up to a boundary term. And usually in physics, we think that such boundary terms don't have any physics associated with them. And so it looks like this is going to imply that um, this theta term is actually irrelevant. And in uh, quantum electrodynamics, that's actually exactly true. And in quantum chromodynamics, it's actually not true. And to see why it's not true is where topology comes into the game. So think for a moment about a system which has topology that you're more familiar with. Think about the sphere. The sphere is flat space, but tied together into a ball in some way that gives it some non-trivial topology. And when you try to apply a system of coordinates onto the sphere, which we do every time we draw a map, you can do that locally. Well, you can draw a map of, say, India and give perfectly sensible coordinates, which will, which will be completely useful. And if you try to extend these coordinates over all of the Earth, then if you choose the standard ones, the Mercator coordinates, then they will fail at the North and South Poles. You can do a little bit better. You can define a coordinate system that only fails at the South Pole, but you cannot define a coordinate system on the sphere, which is free of any singularity. And it turns out in a gauge theory, like electrodynamics or like the strong interactions, the gauge field itself is some kind of a coordinate set for the gauge connection. And it cannot in general be determined everywhere without any singularities in the same sense that you can't write coordinates on the sphere without there being singular something somewhere. It's possible that I cannot define my gauge fields everywhere without there being somewhere singular. As soon as I cut one point out of space time, then the topology of space-time becomes so trivial that I actually can define the gauge fields everywhere. Um, 
but they may become singular as they approach the point I cut out. Um, so maybe it's too dangerous to try to go into all the details of how that happens, but let's just say that it turns out that um, they can become singular as you approach this point. And if I try to integrate um, this, this combination, which is supposed to appear in the action, E dot B, over all of space, then um, its integral over all of space is determined essentially by an index describing how singular the gauge fields become as they approach the point I had to cut out. So this is sort of like if you look at how singular the coordinates on the sphere are as you approach the South Pole, the degree of coordinate singularity that you find there actually tells you that you're on a surface with genus zero. And if you try to put coordinates on a torus, you can. It doesn't have to have a singularity. And if you try to put coordinates on a system with two holes, then you can't again. But the, the way that the coordinates diverge when you approach the singularity will be opposite. So in the same sense, I have to cut a point out here to make sure that I can define the gauge fields everywhere. And the way that the gauge fields become singular as I approach that is de determined by an index called the instanton number. And that is the integral over the full volume of this E dot B up to factors of eight pi squared. Okay. So on a compact no boundary space, the integral of this quantity multiplying theta has to be an integer. And that means that if this theta term is present in my Lagrangian, so if my Lagrangian has this, and then what I'm supposed to do What I'm supposed to do if I'm calculating the action is to take an integral of this Lagrangian. Let's see if I can do this. D, oh, this doesn't work very well, sorry. D4x, no, that doesn't work very well. Okay, I won't try to do that anymore. Um, and so I'm trying to integrate this term here over space. Oh, I have to get rid of these guys now. Okay, so I'm trying to, I have to, I have to turn this off. Okay, no more trying to draw, I apologize. So when I integrate this term over all of space, because this integral becomes a, an integer, I'm gonna get exponent of i theta times the integer. Now you see why I, I chose to write this theta as theta implying that it's some kind of an angle. If theta is two pi, then that's the same as theta being zero. This exponent is always one. If theta is not two pi, then this introduces phases into the path integral over all possible gauge field configurations. So the partition function, which determines, say, the vacuum energy, for instance, is an integral over all things that the gauge fields can possibly do, weighted exponentially by the action, times, if this theta is there, some phases determined by these uh, topological indexes. Okay, now how big do I expect these phases to be? Um, well, there's a triangle inequality, which says that E dot B is always smaller than E squared plus B squared over two. And that means that if E dot B integrates up to be one, then E squared plus B squared over two has to integrate up to be at least one. And that turns out to imply that the action is at least eight pi squared over T squared, which means that configurations which have these topological knots in them have an exponential suppression 
in the path integral. So they're very rare, or they would be very rare if the coupling of the strong interactions were small. The coupling of the strong interactions is strongly scale dependent. At long distances, it's actually large. So this exponential suppression isn't a suppression. At short distances, it's small and this exponential suppression is severe. And that means that the susceptibility, the mean squared number of instantons that happen is some infrared dominated integral. And it can be estimated within QCD to be of order the 100 MeV scale to the fourth. And if you put that in and you put in some lattice QCD studies of how strongly such a theta term should cause the, electric, the, the neutron to have an electric dipole moment, you discover that this theta based on the experimental constraints I described earlier should be less than about 10 to the minus 10. So what we know experimentally from these uh, neutron dipole moment experiments I described here is that if this theta is present, it's smaller than 10 to the minus 10. So consistent with zero and very, very small. That's really strange. Usually things aren't really small unless there's a reason. And so let's look to see if there's some explanation for why QCD should just not have this angle. And there's a proposal called the Axion. It's already about 40 years old as a proposal, which could explain why this is true. I add another field to my theory called phi. And it has a Lagrangian with respect to symmetry in which phi's angle gets rotated. And through some rather clever uh, couplings, which I think I won't try to explain here, um, the phase of this, so this is a complex field, so I can think of it as, as a real and imaginary part. I can think of it living in the complex plane, or I can think of it as having a length and an angle. And that, that angle, the argument of this field can couple in exactly the same way as theta does to QCD. And then it's a combination of this field's angle and theta QCD, which actually determines the physics. The um, partition function no longer determines the energy of the vacuum. It determines the energy when this field takes a particular phase. And you all know that if I perform an integral with some random phases in it, the answer will be smaller than if I perform an integral where everything is adding with a positive sign. Phases will only if, cause phase cancellation and make integrals smaller. The smaller this integral, the smaller my partition function, the higher my free energy is. So um, the presence of these instantons makes it energetically expensive to have non-zero values of this theta angle. And if I have a genuine field, which can have genuine field dynamics, then it can shift to a value which will remove that. And so the field automatically adjusts to a value where time reversal is respected. So there's this idea, you add one new degree of freedom, a scalar field, the scalar field gives you the freedom to change the value of this theta, and the physics prefers the value which respects time reversal. This is a, a great scenario. It could explain why theta is zero, but it can explain something else. Um, because early in the universe, this field would not be at that value. It would be at some random value, or it could be a random value that's varying through space. And then as the universe cools down and the field discovers that it has a preferred value, it starts to oscillate and choose that value. But the oscillations, which are left over in this process, um, have an energy of their own. And in fact, they behave like matter. And in fact, they behave like cold dark matter. And so they're a perfect cold dark matter candidate. The only thing is that to determine their dynamics, I have to understand exactly how strongly um, the free energy prefers the value of theta equals zero, 
which means I have to understand how frequent this topology occurs in QCD. And I have to understand that at the very high temperatures, which were present early in the universe. We did an estimate of what temperatures are relevant for the evolution of this field and found that it's when the universe was about one GeV in temperature, which is um, about 12, oh, it's 12 trillion in America, it's 12 billion in India. Uh, degrees Kelvin. And so it's at those temperatures that we have to understand how frequently you have this topology. And now I want to tell you a little bit about how we go about trying to determine that. So what we know is that topology is relatively common at low temperatures and becomes rapidly much, much rarer at high temperatures. We know that because at high temperatures, the effective gauge coupling becomes small. And I already argued that, that suppresses the presence of topology. We have an estimate of how fast that happens, but to have an accurate determination. And if we had an accurate determination of this, then we could actually calculate with no other input what the mass of this axion would be and make a prediction which would help the people searching for it as dark matter. So we would like then to understand exactly how fast this top uh, topology becomes rare as you go up in temperature, up to a temperature of about seven times the critical temperature of QCD, which is about one GeV. So that's going to be my goal. And the problem is going to be that it's a goal to learn how often there is topology when topology is very, very rare. So how am I going to do that? Well, the only rigorous first principles, reliable, non-perturbative tool we have to describe the strong interactions is lattice QCD. What is that? Well, what I'm trying to understand is the partition function. That's an integral over all the possible things the gauge fields and the fermions could be doing weighted by an exponential of minus the action of that configuration. The problem is the gauge fields live at every point in space. This is one integral for each component of the gauge fields at each point in space, at each point in Euclidean time. How many points is that? Well, it's an infinite number of points. So it's an infinite number of integrals. And you just can't do an infinite number of integrals. At least you can't do them numerically, let's say. And if I want to do this in a really non-perturbative way where I'm not making any sloppy approximations, then I have to do it as a numerical integral. That's really my goal is to perform this as a numerical integral. The only way I'm going to make that work is by discretizing space so that I have a finite number of points, so that I have a finite number of integrals to do. This works. In 1974, Wilson showed a way to write this down, which preserves the gauge invariance as an exact invariance, even with this discretized space. And that means that you capture the most important physics in this path integral at the expense of losing all the points in between your lattice spacing so that you're not quite exactly determining continuum physics, but you can get do better and better as you make your lattice spacing smaller. And typically the results converge at least quadratically as you make your lattice spacing smaller. You can take a continuum limit and you can get out the physics that you want. The problem is how many integrals are you doing? This, the fields have of order hundred components. And that's per point. Space is four dimensional, even if I'm not very, um, aggressive and I make my space 12 by 32 by 32 by 32, which you would argue is a fairly coarse discretization of space and also living in a rather small box, I already have 10 to the eight integrations that I have to carry out. For a larger box, lattice people frequently have to do 10 to the 10, 10 to the 12 integrals. That's too many integrals to do numerically by say, random sampling. 
So I have to think about some good way of performing these integrals. There's also complications of exactly how you did integrals involving fermions, but I will skip those for today. So let me talk a little bit about how you do integrals in very, very high dimensional spaces. This is because this is a problem which physicists encounter more often than you would think. And the simple-minded thing, which usually works for a one-dimensional integral, is I just randomly sample points in the integration range. And let me see why that doesn't work. It's because I'm doing an integral where the integrand is exponential. And almost everywhere it's exponentially small. So there's some spot where the integrand is large and everywhere else it's absolutely tiny. And if I randomly choose points, I'm just never going to choose a point right at the spike, especially if there's 10 to the eight different dimensions. And so this is just one point in some very, very high dimensional space. I'm just going to fail to sample the important configurations. So I'll do a sampling and none of them will hit the place that actually controls this integral and I'll learn nothing. The alternative is to put your sample at the peak. Try to sample the place where the integral is big. This turns out not to work because the peak is very, very narrow. And in some sense, it has wide shoulders. So if I take this picture and I zoom in just around this peak, so I leave out you know, 99.99% of the integration range and just look at the part where something's happening. It's sort of generically, it's high dimensional, it's much nastier than what it looks like, but it generically looks like something like this. There's a spike and then there's these very wide shoulders. And the integral is actually dominated by these shoulders. And um, one way to think about why that's more and more likely to happen as you have more and more integrals to do is that the shoulders stretch out from the peak in every dimension, in every direction. So if I have 10 to the eight directions, then I have 10 to the eight directions that shoulders are happening in. And that means I'm gonna have 10 to the eight times more shoulder than peak. And so the shoulder can very easily dominate the integral, even if the height of the shoulder is 10 to the minus eight of the height of the peak. And we're familiar with this issue from statistical mechanics. In fact, this is what st statistical mechanics is all about. The peak is where you have a low energy in the stat mech version. So in stat mech, instead of an exponential of minus the action, it's an exponential of minus the energy over the temperature, the Boltzmann. So think of this as like a Boltzmann factor. And you know that you can make the Boltzmann factor large by... Um, going to where the energy is low, but you have lots of phase space in these shoulders where the, that is they have a higher entropy. And there's always this balance between energy and entropy to figure out what actually contributes. And so I have to do a sampling in a way that respects the balance between energy and entropy. And the way to do that is so-called important sampling. So this is that if I'm trying to say, determine the expectation value of an operator, I want to perform an integral over all possible configurations, weighted by e to the minus the action, times the observable in that configuration. This is the standard path integral. What I do is a sampling of all possible configurations using the measure times this e to the minus action as a weight. I build a sample of such configurations, and then I just evaluate my observable on the sample. So that's one over the number of elements in my sample times the sum over the elements in my sample of the value on that element. To do that, I need to find an algorithm which can wander around through the phase space in a way which respects this weight that prefers the likely places, but prefers them by the right amount. And there are old algorithms and modern and very sophisticated algorithms from doing that. The best at the moment is something called the hybrid Monte Carlo algorithm. Uh, it's been continuously further optimized over the decades. 
And the idea of this algorithm is a Markov chain. I have a space of possible gauge field configurations, and I wander through that space in an essentially um, path-connected way. Um, and the reason I have to do it that way is that if I try to make big jumps in my phase space to somewhere very different than where I am, that's typically somewhere which has a much larger action, which gives me, which means that it's, should be far more exponentially suppressed than where I'm jumping from. And that means that I can't do that jump. So that has a very low acceptance if I try to make big jumps. Okay. So if that's how I'm sampling my space of configurations, then I'm now going to give you an argument that is actually impossible to measure topology on the lattice. And that's because the idea of topology is that the possible gauge fields are split into different classes categorized by an integer, which is this uh, instanton number. So there's the n equals zero, there's the n equals ones, there's the n equals twos, there's the n equals minus ones. And if I'm wandering in a continuous way through this space and I start at n equals zero, I will always stay in n equals zero. And if I start at n equals one, I will always stay in n equals one. And I won't be able to sample back and forth between these different regions. That makes the sampling impossible. Now that's actually not quite true on the lattice because the lattice does not capture this topology perfectly. It actually fills in space in between these topological sectors. But if it's supposed to look close to continuum physics, then it must be doing that somehow in a very slight, very inefficient way. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in what follows. So how does this work? Well, imagine that I have some topological objects, some knot of gauge fields, which carries this topology. It has a size. And if it's many lattice spacings across, if it's like this big, then the lattice has to see it, it's there. And I'll say, ah, I have topology one. If it's tiny, if it's smaller than my lattice size spacing, then it's, I don't see it at all. It's disappeared in between my lattice sites. It's just not there. And there must be a continuous range of the size of such an object, such that it can be about one or two lattice spacings across, in which case it's really not clear if my lattice will see it or not. And that's actually bad because it means that topology isn't well-defined on the lattice. But it's also good because it means that there can be bridges between these topological sectors. So these very small topological knots, which I'll call dislocations, um, can serve as bridges between these topological sectors. And what I really see is something more like this. I have a topological sector and then a narrow skinny little bridge and then the next sector and then a narrow skinny bridge in the next sector. And that would be in vacuum. At temperature, it's a little bit worse than that. Um, in the continuum limit, these bridges get thinner and thinner. And in the high temperature limit, it turns out that the topological sectors other than the no topology sector get rarer and rarer. The first problem means that it becomes hard to sample. The second problem means that it you, becomes hard to get statistics. So the vacuum looks like the red line here. There are regions which are one topology, the next topology, the next topology with very narrow bridges that get narrower and narrower as you go to lattice spacing zero. And high temperature is one very, very large region, a narrow bridge, a much, much smaller region, an uh, even narrower bridge, a tiny region. And this is what you have to sample. And there's two issues. One is if you're wandering around, you're very unlikely to wander into this neck. And the other problem is once you do, you're, you're quickly going to leave this neck and go back in the big area again, and you're going to spend almost all of your time in the big area. And both of those problems make it very, very difficult to determine the relative likelihood of being in these unlikely configurations against the likely one. Okay, um, this I will skip. So if I just do the straightforward thing and randomly sample uh, gauge field configurations and measure their topology, here's what I find. 
It's a sample of tens of thousands of configurations and none of them have topology and I learned absolutely nothing. So this doesn't work. I have to use a trick. And now the reason I'm telling you all about this is because I think this is A, a neat trick and B, a trick which maybe you can find a way to apply in something that you work on. I think that this trick is universal enough that it has other applications and it's something that not enough people know about. And that this is a trick of sampling called reweighting. So an expectation value and a path integral is an integral over all possibilities weighted exponentially by a, a Boltzmann factor in statistical physics or a, an action factor in quantum field theory times the value of your, your operator divided by the same thing without the operator. I can multiply and divide by any function I want. I'll call it e to the plus w and e to the minus w. w is some unknown function of a measurable I'll name q. What's q going to be? Q is going to be something that's zero here, one here, and a half in this bridge. Now what I do, so this is just an identity because I've multiplied by something times one over something. And I multiply in the denominator also by something times one over something. What I can now do is I can use, I have to do it, I have to go back to, I have to draw one more thing. I can use this combination here as my weight and think about this as part of my measurable. I'm using this as my weight and this as my measurable. And so now instead of sampling using my weight as a sampling, using my um, Boltzmann factor, I'm sampling using a Boltzmann factor times whatever other weight I want. This can be a weight that makes it more likely to see rare things that are interesting things. So it makes it more likely to see where there is topology. Since I've missampled in this way, when I evaluate expectation values, I have to undo that missampling by putting an e to the minus w into the importance I apply to each element in the sample. If I do that, then I can use any sampling weight I want, and I'm still making a valid determination of this expectation value. But if I choose a W carefully, then I can find one such that um, such that I can undo the, the poor statistics problems I've just described. So, my plan is the following. I'm going to choose some function Q and a weight function W. So that we'll spend about equal amounts of time studying ordinary non-topological configurations, interesting topological configurations, and these small dislocations that you need to get back and forth between them. And Q has to be something that can tell these three things apart. And the way to do that is to find something that measures topology, but is deliberately imperfect. And let's just say that we found a way to do that. And um, the result conceptually is the following. So I have some variables. And if the variable is zero, then I'm in this no topology region. And if the variable is one, then I'm in this topology region. And if the variable is in between, I'm in this bridge. And now I choose my weight so that I prefer not to be at Q equals zero. I prefer to be in this bridge and I'm also happy to be in this Q equals one region. And that replaces this version with this very narrow um, bridge and this small region with this uh, sort of cyan region where the bridge and the, the Q equals one are much, much more common. 
So that's the cartoon of the way to reweight in order to measure topology. Um, this is too technical, I will skip it. Let's just say that I actually have to reweight in two different variables. Um, there's a problem though. What do I use for this reweighting function? How do I even decide that? Because if I use the reweighting function, which prefers these q equal one too much, then I'll spend all of my time over here. If it doesn't prefer them enough, I'll spend all of my time over here. And the thing is that knowing the right amount to prefer these q equals one is basically the same thing as knowing the relative likelihood to be in these two places, which is what I'm trying to find out. So there's some chicken and egg problem, if you will, some consist self-consistency, how do I get um, where I'm trying to go without knowing where it is? And the, the cute thing is that we found an iterative and self-consistent way to do this, to build this weight function without having to know it and that it's automated so that you don't have, to, there's no by hand tinkering involved. You can set the computer running and it will find it. And the idea is the following, I make my weight function a piecewise linear function. And I say, well, wherever I am, that must be too easy to be there. And so I'll lower my function where I am and then I'll update again. And once I manage to explore back and forth between the, the, um, the range of values that I'm interested in, then I'll reduce how fast I change the function because I'm starting to learn something about the shape of the function. And as I, as I, narrow, as I continue to narrow in how, how, um, oversensitive to undersensitive I am in the way that I change my function, then I'll converge on the right value of this W. And once I've gotten close enough, then I'll switch and do a Monte Carlo where I use this as fixed and I'll use that one to do my final, final determinations. And just to give you an idea what this looks like, we made a movie of it once. Can everyone see this? So let's see if I can make it a little bit bigger. So this is my W function, which starts out being zero. I know nothing about what it should look like. And this is the Q value. Here are things without instantons. Here are things that are intermediate. Here are things that have this topology. And I start out with something with no topology. And because it has no topology, I'm going to lower this function. And despite lowering the function, Wait, why is it not running? Oh, come on. There, sorry, I don't know why that happened. As I lower the function, it's going to stay in this region until the function has been lowered far enough that it's able to escape and start exploring other areas. And then after it's managed to get from the top, from the bottom to the top and back to the bottom, then I'm gonna soften how much it's changing this function uh, and, and gradually converge on the right shape. And you see that after you've been doing this for a while, it's successful in being able to run from the likely no topology configurations to the unlikely topology configurations through the even less likely intermediate configurations without any real uh, difficulty or hiccups. So that's the... So that's the idea of this automated algorithm for finding this reweighting. And once we get it to work, then rather than sampling and sampling and never seeing anything, you sample and you sample and you continuously jump back and forth between having topology up here, not having topology down here, having something halfway between, in between. And I can use this and the precise amount I over weighted these configurations to determine how common topology really is. And we did this very successfully. We were able to extrapolate to vanishing lattice spacings and determine, at least in the theory without quarks, how common topology is as a function of temperature, finding um, a reduction in the frequency of the, the commonness of topological configurations with temperature that is 
well in agreement with the expectations, but determines the exact value with error bars of the sort of tens of percent level. And for this last data point, without this reweighting, you would have two configurations out of every 10 to the nine, which have topology. And you could sample forever and never find it. Okay, so that's what I wanted to tell you about. In summary, QCD, the theory of the strong interactions is a very non-trivial theory. And one of the ways it's non-trivial is it has topology. And this leads to the so-called theta puzzle. Um, the theta puzzle is that there's a parameter in the theory which should be there and which would make the theory violate time reversal. But measurements show that it doesn't violate time reversal. Axions address this puzzle. And they could also explain what the dark matter is in the universe. To understand the dynamics of these axions and make a prediction for the axion mass, I have to know the topological susceptibility and a temperature range up to something over one GeV. Topology is hard to do on, for two reasons. And here I'm again concentrating on the non-perturbative determination on the lattice, which is the only rigorous way we have to determine it. One reason is that it's hard to get between topologies, and the other reason is it's hard to get topology at all if you're at high temperatures. We showed that there's a technique called reweighting, which is a very nice general purpose approach for uh, sampling properties which are dominated by rare configurations. And um, if you can find an observable, which tells you whether you're in the interesting or the boring part of your configuration space, you can use it as a reweighting variable. And if you don't know how strongly to reweight, we showed how to build an automated uh, determination of the reweighting function. This overcomes both the limitations of the difficulties going between topologies and of the rarity of topological configurations. And all that's left is to apply it in the theory, including quarks, which I think, um, though not simple, there is no showstoppers that we're aware of. And once we have, then we should be able to predict the mass of the dark matter axion with precision. Okay, uh, thank you for your attention and I would be very happy to address any questions. Thanks Gary for this very wonderful talk. So we have an open question. Can you, can you speak up or hold the microphone closer or something? Uh, can you hear? Yes, but you're, you're still very quiet. Maybe you can hold the microphone closer. I, I can hear you, but not very clearly. Uh, hello? Is yes. Well, it just seems that the microphone has a very poor gain somehow. I, I don't hear it very well. Uh -huh. Maybe. If somebody online has a question, or if somebody wants to type in the chat. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Uh, okay, um, I have a couple of very basic questions, if you don't mind. Um, so Please. if you would go to uh, slide 12, I believe. Slide, which one? 12. Oh, too far. Yes. Ah, so uh, maybe the next one where you show the phase, uh, or the previous one uh, where you show the phase. Ah, here, this one. Right. So, uh, so uh, the exponential, am I supposed to take the real part of this? Is that what the Z? Okay, so the integral, so yes and no. The integral over all possible gauge configurations 
ha, um, has exactly the same number of configurations which will give a positive and a negative phase here. So if I perform the integral as I, as I wrote, you'll actually get a real value. I see. Um, but if you put a, a real part on this integrand, it wouldn't do any harm. Let's put it that way. So in other words, the imaginary part just... Uh, the imaginary part cancels between configurations. Okay. Yeah. And in the next, uh, next slide, or the next one. Yes, so uh, why is it important to uh, know about this uh, topological uh, properties about TC and not below TC? Okay, so um, I'm, let me see if I can find a, a better explanation of this. Um, so by the way, this TC is the same uh, where the chiral condensate either vanishes or is uh, non-zero, right? Is that the same TC we are talking about here? Or? Yes. Okay. Oh no, that's not it. Okay, hold on. Um, Ah, here, okay. See, here's a movie that might make it a little bit clearer. So I have a scalar field that's a complex field. That means it takes values in the plane. And the black curve and blue curves here are describing the potential that that scalar field feels, okay? And initially, the universe randomly throws that scalar field into some point, and it will rapidly slide down to be somewhere along this blue line. Okay, and the thing that distinguishes the points along this blue line is the value of the argument of the scalar field. And that's exactly the thing that I add to theta QCD to get the total theta that, that uh, the universe responds to. And as the universe evolves, the potential gradually tilts and the field starts to oscillate. Okay, and there's three time, there's three um, sort of, there's, there's three time ranges in this evolution. There's a first time range where the field is just still sitting there and it hasn't started oscillating. Then there's a second where it started to oscillate and it does the first couple of oscillations, okay? Then there's the third where it's oscillated several times and it's just going back and forth, okay? In the first where it was just sitting there, that it, how much the potential is tilted doesn't matter because the field isn't doing anything yet. Once the field starts moving, then there's this period starting about now where it does matter how tilted the potential is. So that is the thing that I claim starts at about one or 1.1 GeV temperature. At the end, it's oscillating back and forth very rapidly compared to how fast the potential is tilting, compared to how fast the universe is expanding, and its behavior is essentially adiabatic. Once the behavior becomes adiabatic, then we know what's going to happen. There's some clean prediction for how that that part of the behavior will continue. It's only the part in the middle where it's making the first couple of oscillations that sort of, um, if you will, confusing and which requires detailed calculations. And the real situation is worse than what I just showed. The field is doing that differently, independently at different points in space and there can be um, another kind of topology, topological obstructions to its straightening itself out. And that's another talk. I don't have time to give that talk, but that's okay. the idea. Does that, does that help? Yeah, yeah, so that helps. I had to skip some things. That's one of the things I skipped. Yeah, no problem. So okay. uh, just to clarify, so 
as uh, time increases in that uh, video you showed, I'm going to the left here in temperature, right? Uh, exactly. So the beginning of that video, I was somewhere over here. Mm -hmm. The potential was so flat that it had no, no roll. I come to maybe about here, the field starts to roll. It rolls once by the time I get to here, another, 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 another. By the time I'm here, it's oscillating hundreds of times. The behavior becomes adiabatic, which means that it becomes very predictable. And so everything that happens after that, the, the details of the potential actually don't matter after that. So this is for the um, dynamics of the axion field itself. Exactly. The but, dynamics uh, of the axion field are sensitive, roughly speaking, to this temperature range. But the instant on number itself is, uh, you know, not uh, related to what you're talking about here. The instant on number... Or the, how, uh, how important non-trivial uh, topology configurations are. Is that... That's what determines to... this blue curve. Okay. Yeah. So that's why we have to determine this, the, 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 how common these instantons are. So if these instantons are very common, then these phases are large. Hmm. And that means, it, unless theta is zero, these phases are large. And that means that there's a big difference between the partition function with theta and without theta. And that means that the, the, there's a steep potential. If instantons are very, very rare, then this phase is almost always zero. And there's only a very subtle difference between theta being zero and being not zero. And that means that the axion doesn't feel the effects of quantum chromodynamics yet. Hmm. These questions are maybe a little advanced for a colloquium, but I'm oh, still sorry. Happy. Yeah, okay. Well, no, I'm still happy to answer them. So my last question is that 10 to yeah. the minus nine that you had in the last but one transparency. So what was that again? So what was the... Okay, so we studied a box of a certain size looking for topology. And one approach is just to randomly create lattice configurations and heck if they have topology. And if you do that, and each one is truly an independent configuration, which they won't be, then two per billion will have topology at this temperature. And so to determine the, the expectation, the, the co how common topology is at this point, you have to, with high statistics, find these two per billion configurations. Yes, so so what, we, yeah, right. what we did is we made it 100 million times more likely to have topology, and then it was two in 10. And that's something you can find. So and does we, this uh, translate to some probability in the continuum also about... Uh, yeah, this is, this is after a continuum extrapolation. So what we really did is we, we did this at five different temperatures. Mm -hmm. um, for this box, we did it at three. For other boxes, we did it at five. Um, and then you perform an extrapolation to the continuum. And here, this is a, this is a log of topology versus of uh, topological susceptibility versus the square of the lattice spacing, which is the right um, set of units for performing the extrapolation. And that, that's what we find. Sorry, then what is the interpretation of the 10 to the minus nine uh, stated in the continuum uh, theory? Right, that is what fraction of, so we, we, when you, you can't study all of the universe, you study a box of QCD, of hot, strongly interacting matter, and you make a box big enough that it's going to see infinite volume-like physics. Ah, okay. okay. We chose some size of a box, which we explicitly checked. If you make it larger, you get the same answer. Um, if we made our box twice bigger, we would see twice as then we would see topology twice as often because it's randomly distributed to space. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but for the box size that we chose at that temperature, 
two out of 10 to the nine configurations randomly drawn from the ensemble have, have topology and the other 10 to the nine minus two don't have topology. And that right. means that if you perform a random sampling of configurations, you will just never find the ones with topology. That's the point. Okay. But I would then also like to know about a uh, much bigger box when I take the box size to infinity and how do I... Uh, okay, so... Out? So there are strong arguments that after your box reaches a certain size, the mean square topology grows linearly with volume. I see. Okay. This is just, if you have rare random events, it's just Poisson. Mm. Okay. All right. okay. And if your box is too small, then um, basically the physics of QCD can see that it's in a box. And if it's mm. bigger than a certain size, it, it doesn't recognize the box anymore. It doesn't, it doesn't discover that something's wrong. Essentially. Sorry. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I took too long. Thank you. Uh, that's, well, if, if everyone else is okay, then I'm okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Other questions?